Hello, John. How are you? I'm doing doing well. Thanks for having me on. Believe me, it's my pleasure. Uh, I I hope that um, this becomes the first of uh, many appearances for you on Blogging Heads. Um, I think, uh, you know, George and I, we talk about biology, but um, we're faking it, let's face it. We're sort of uh, more up on physics and cosmology and all those totally useless scientific disciplines uh, mm -hmm. than you are. So you're immersed in biology. That's where the action is. Um, I, I just wanted to tell people a little bit about who you are. Uh, you have been described as by the New York Times as as fine a science essayist as we have. And um, there's actually a journalist named Mary Roach who has said of you, the guy is smarter than anyone I know. If you were to open up his head, the brain would his brain would burst out like an airbag, which is actually sort of alarming, but um, <laughs> high, high praise indeed. Uh, but I think of you as being the best, and I hope this is probably going to piss off some other friends of mine who write about biology, but I think of you as the best um, biology journalist out there. And uh, so um, you write for a lot of publications. You write a lot for the Science Times. You have these wonderful uh, stories on um, both on evolution and sort of basic biological principles as well as all these bizarre animals that illustrate principles of biology. Uh, you write about biology on your blog, which is called The Loom and is one of the most popular science blogs uh, online. You, um, you used to write a column for Natural History, as I recall, which was the same column that Stephen Jay Gould used to write for them for a couple of decades. Is that right? Yeah, he wrote it for a couple of decades. I think I wrote it for two or three years. I sort of went back and forth between Jared Diamond for a while. Well, that's still... I mean, what a pulpit that is. Um, maybe we can talk about Stephen Jay Gould um, a little later. If you, I don't know if you know it, but sure. he is one of uh, Bob Wright's um, intellectual heroes. Um, <laughs> also, uh, you've you've written six books, uh, at least according to my count. Um, Soul Made Flesh, which is this really wonderful history of uh, the origins, really, of brain science. Um, At the Water's Edge, which is uh, talks about um, some of these bizarre transitions in the history of evolution. Uh, animals that went from water on, onto land and then back to water again. Uh, whales are the primary example of that. You also fold in all this this new stuff about uh, Evo Devo. Maybe we can get into Evo Devo later. Uh, Parasite Rex, one of the truly creepy books of science journalism that's ever been published. Uh, wonderful book. And then um, you've also got a, uh, a book uh, on evolution. Uh, something that you did for the Smithsonian on human origins. I just noticed you have a, you just edited a book, a new edition of The Descent of Man that's coming out. That's right. Uh, with, with Franz de Waal, did, did he edit it also, or he was your co-introducer uh, to the book? He, he wrote an introduction for the book, um, and then what I did was I selected um, some chunks of the book to really um, help introduce people to it because it's a pretty uh, long kind of wandering narrative and so I kind of selected some key sections and then introduced those talking about the history but also talking about um, what we know about human evolution today and sort of how much Darwin got right and how much he didn't that's interesting. So you're saying that Charles Darwin could have used a good editor. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty obsessive. Um, part of the problem was that he was trying to think of every single objection that everybody at the time might have to his ideas. And so he would just gather together you know, just vast, vast, vast amounts of information. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to, to make those points, but, you know, you kind of feel like you're getting off track sometimes, 
So like in The Descent yeah. of Man, it's actually two books. It's The Descent of Man, and then the second part is about uh, sex and sexual selection in animals. And mm-hmm. so we've got chapter after chapter about birds and, you know, fish and all these other things. And, um, you know, I think for a reader who just wants to kind of start learning about what Darwin had to say, you get to a point where you say enough already. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, well, good. So the abridged um, uh, Darwin, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, and then you've got, and by the way, you're the kind of science writer who makes the rest of us um, look bad because you're so goddamn productive. You've got a new book coming out within, is it uh, early next year, called Microcosm, which is uh, sort of looking at E. coli, these back. Uh, bacteria with which we have a symbiotic relationship. Um, and that's coming out when? Th- that's coming out in May. May, okay. Um, so um, uh, I think that provides sort of an overview of uh, of how much I uh, how much you do. Um, what I thought we could talk about today is. Um, you know, you are really covering the frontiers of biology and telling us about the uh, exciting things going on. And as you know, I have this kind of jaded view of, um, somewhat jaded view of science. So uh, I have argued that um, the really big revolutions in science are over. I think it's that's not, it's barely disputable in physics anymore. Um, in biology, uh, it's a harder case to make, but I just want to give you a quote um, from um, Richard Dawkins, and uh, you tell me if you agree with it, and then we can talk ab- about uh, the implications of, of your view. Uh, okay. Dawkins said in The Blind Watchmaker, our existence, human existence, is a mystery no longer because it is solved. Darwin and Wallace solved it. Though we shall continue to add footnotes to their solution for a while yet. So I just want to get your reaction to that quote. <clears throat> well, I have a problem with these sorts of sweeping statements, um, you know, made by Dawkins and you know, and by you, in the sense that um, they're not really, in a sense scientific statements. I mean, what is a footnote? What's a revolution? What's a, an appendix? Mm-hmm. What's an extra chapter? I don't know. Um, you know, what I do know is that, um, you know, I write books about biology, and within a couple of years, they're, they're like painfully out of date. Uh, they're just sort of status reports. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I look at um, At the Water's Edge, which I wrote... Um, Nine year, what well, came out nine years ago, and I kind of cringe because it's it's so quaint. Um, there's so much more that scientists know about just these transitions, mm-hmm. um, and you know, biologists uh, know a lot more about a lot of different things. And, and not only that, but what's important, I think, is that they also know more now about how little they know. Yeah, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, you know, you, we've got, you know, 18,000 or so genes, um, and they only take up uh, between 1% and 2% of the genome, and so people have been wondering for a long time what the other 98% does or doesn't do, um, and, you know, a lot of it uh, looks to be um, you know, viruses that are just kind of freeloading off of us or dead genes, but then there's also a lot of stuff in there that is serving a function. You know, Mm -hmm. there there are these um, pieces of DNA in there that they're not making proteins, but they're they're making these sort of intermediate between DNA and proteins, RNA, and that RNA is doing all sorts of weird stuff that scientists are just starting to figure out. So... Yeah. I don't know, you know, I mean, uh, there there will never be another Darwin, probably, but, you know, the the way that scientists look at evolution now is not how Darwin looked at it. I mean, there are the, you know, key principles that 
he talked about, but um, there are all sorts of other things that he couldn't have even started to guess. It's not much well, of an answer, I guess. I don't know. Well, I, actually, I wanted to talk to you about um, the genetic code and our understanding of heredity and and uh, and um, how DNA constructs uh, organisms and all that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. when I got into this business in the early 80s, there was this kind of triumphalism that all that had been figured out, uh, that we, we had this very straightforward um, understanding of how uh, DNA, with the help of RNA, makes proteins which, are, which uh, form um, uh, organisms and the principles of development are, are working out. But it seems to me from your writings and, and uh, some other things that I've been reading, uh, like Nicholas Wade has been covering this as well in the New York Times, that that uh, seemingly simple picture is really um, dissolving, and everything is getting much more complicated. And I wonder if this is, and you know, may, maybe again you resist framing these uh, issues in this sort of way, but is the basic DNA paradigm, uh, which together with evolution tells us how life works, is that really in danger of being replaced by something significantly different? Um, yeah, it's interesting you use the word danger. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I look at that, I mean, danger has sort of a pejorative sense, and I think that, you know, when people do try to claim that everything is all locked up, then any change to the scientific consensus then it gets to be seen as a danger, I guess. Um, so, you know, you certainly have had some scientists who have uh, been very um, emphatic about, you know, what's, um, what's all sewed up and what isn't. Um, and, um, you know, it's the, really, you know, you just have to, to, to take what scientists learn as just sort of status reports. That's, that's just how I see it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, the, uh, the central dogma, um, you know, if you actually go back and look how Francis Crick described it, he was being almost kind of um, self-effacing about it. You know, he's like, okay, let's just, let's call it the central dogma. And, you know, he sort of, you almost kind of hear him laughing about how um, doctrinaire it sounds. Mm -hmm. But basically he was just saying, look, so here's a ba the basic idea for, for all this data that we've been trying to figure out. Here it is, the DNA gets turned into RNA, which gets turned into protein, and not the other way around. Yeah. And, you know, for a whole lot of biology, that's really important. Now, it turns out that there are other important things involved in biology and, and uh, even in evolution, too. Um, but, uh, you know, none of that makes sense without the, you know, central dogma. I just tried to make quotation marks, and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> no, that's... Uh, blogging has people... Uh, the the um, people who run blogging heads are very big on us using hand gestures and so forth to add drama Thank to uh, to our conversations. Um, but let me let me uh, let's go to some of the specific things that you write about, and maybe yeah. some of these larger issues can emerge from them. Um, I think you are you've really got a lock on the parasite niche of uh, <laughs> biology. Um, yeah, your book, Parasite Rex, was really a lot of fun because it had all these stories about these incredibly disgusting, creepy organisms. I don't, you probably see them very fondly, uh, but I wonder <laughs> if you can sort of tell us a little bit about um, that book and maybe anything else that you've written about parasites recently. I, I've just read a couple of pieces of yours on the, on the web about a, a parasitic uh, wasp that is just is bizarre, and then there's uh, Giardia, I think. But um, tell us how you got into parasites and what they can tell us about the complexities of evolution. Well, you know, I mean, like uh, every 10-year-old boy at least, and probably a lot of girls too, I was uh, quite fascinated with parasites. You know, I mean, when you read about a tapeworm, you just can't believe that anything could exist like that. Um, and then uh, when I got to be a science writer, I realized that, you know, parasites were really interesting to scientists and not just for the, the creepy factor, although, you know, that can't hurt. 
Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the people were, were realizing that, you know, parasites are a lot more uh, sophisticated than we gave them credit for, uh, probably a lot more successful than we gave them credit for. In fact, they're probably the most successful kind of life on Earth. Uh, if you just do, like, sheer count of species. Uh, and, um, you know, they're probably really important to the evolution of their hosts. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're shaping uh, their host evolution and maybe their host behavior. Uh, maybe they're crucial to ecosystems, you know, keeping food webs stable, all this stuff. And so once I started really kind of just looking at parasites, it's something to write a book about, um, you know, the bottom just sort of fell out. Uh, and that's what I always take as a good sign for writing a book. Um, you, you know that you're going to be uh, really busy for a couple of years trying to find out everything that's out there. And um, so, you know, the book came out in 2000, and um, I, uh, you know, I, I've been just keeping up with the, the parasites ever since. You know, there are just all sorts of things that just keep uh, happening uh, in the sort of the parasite world. Can you just describe Ampulex compressa? Right, so Ampulex compressa is uh, the Latin name for, um, I believe it's called the emerald cockroach wasp. Mm -hmm. And um, it's this uh, amazing uh, creature. Uh, I actually uh, heard about it from a parasitologist who was in, um, I think it was Zimbabwe. One day he was walking down the road and he told me that he saw this uh, wasp that seemed to be um, carrying or, uh, a cockroach like a dog on a leash pulling on one of its antenna and I just said you gotta be kidding me uh, but then you know I did a little research and then I discovered that uh, yep it's, um, it's real and so it's this wasp that basically uh, uses cockroaches to feed its, uh, its young. And uh, so what uh, it does is it flies up to these guys, these cockroaches, and stings them. And that just sort of paralyzes them for a second. And that gives the wasp enough time to deliver a second sting. And what it does is it, it inserts its stinger into the head of the cockroach and actually sort of snakes it around to um, to the a particular part of the the cockroach brain that controls um, these uh, these re reflexes that these cockroaches have that sort of initiate voluntary responses. So basically, the cockroach becomes a zombie, uh, and the the venom that the wasp injects seems to be this special uh, cocktail of neurotransmitters. So it's a neurosurgeon and a uh, neuropharmacologist and um, and what happens then is that the cockroach loses all um, will as it were and um, and the wasp basically leads it into its burrow and lays an egg kind of underneath the cockroach and then seals up the burrow and then the wasp eggs hatch and they climb basically I believe what they do is they climb inside the cockroach and devour it while the cockroach is still alive. And they form their um, pupa inside there and then develop. And when they're fully formed, they just pop s straight up um, out of the cockroach's uh, dead body. So, uh, oh my you God. know, I know. I mean, it's like, Has I read about this. Has this been on the uh, Discovery Channel yet? That sounds like it would uh, make a great video. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky, you know. I mean, it's you you, you got to be waiting a while and catch them, you know, just as they're poking out. I, I've seen some weird pictures of of them doing this. I put one on my uh, blog about it. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it 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 doesn't sound good just for a, a you know a TV documentary. It sounds good for science fiction, but it's all real. Right. It it is that is bizarre. I I, ha I know that you try to stay away from this whole science and religion thing, and I don't blame you. It gets really <laughs> old fast. But I just have to bring up that Richard Dawkins has used uh, these cases of parasitic wasps burrowing from uh, put, embedding their their um, eggs into other insects, which then uh, eat them from the inside. 
and he's used those as as um, examples of how nature works that should totally eliminate any possibility that there is a benign God who created nature. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, he's he's kind of following a bit in Darwin's footsteps. I mean, Darwin actually talked about some uh, parasitic wasps and, and asked how, you know, a, a, a benevolent creator might be directly responsible for these animals that, that create this, this unbelievable uh, suffering in, in their hosts. Um, although, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it may be that, uh, you know, these hosts don't mind that much. Uh, yeah. You know, they may, you know, because the fact is that, you know, uh, these caterpillars and these other hosts to these wasps, you know, a lot of them just are, they go about their business while they've got all of these... Uh, Parasites growing inside of them, and they keep eating and they keep growing. Um, you know, in a way, it, it, it benefits the parasite that the host is, is healthy at least uh, while the parasite is growing. Um, but okay, but you know, so so does the parasitoid wasp, uh, you know, deny the existence of God or something like that? You know, I just there, I think you, you're you're sort of mixing two kinds of, of arguments. I, you know, because I've seen. Um, you know, I've seen creationists uh, saying that, oh, there, it's actually really good that there are parasitoid wasps because they keep these uh, harmful caterpillar pests in check so that they don't eat all our food or something like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, these arguments, they can go... spin. Right. But, you know, so that's, you know, so, so I, you know, I, I don't know. I just, uh, th those sorts of arguments don't really... Um, Get me going one way or the other. I just, I just think that you know, you're 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 taking scientific observations and then you're trying to make grand supernatural statements about them one way or the other. And uh, that well, let just me let me ask me. you this. What I think is fascinating about <coughs> parasitism is that it it seems to me to be on this uh, spectrum of evolutionary relationships that also include. Um, Symbiosis, and so I would imagine that there's some parasitic relationships. You just su suggested that maybe sometimes the host can benefit in some way, and I would assume that over evolutionary time, what starts out as a purely parasitic one-way uh, relationship becomes symbiotic, and then might even become something more like what you would call cooperation. Uh, so that you know, Darwinism has you know, traditionally been seen as pure competition and nature rat and tooth and claw and all that. But there are all these other more complicated relationships going on, uh, some of which are mutually beneficial. Yeah, I mean, the more scientists look at these um, relationships, the more complicated they get. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, you can you can have uh, parasites that become um, sort of more more mild with their hosts. On the other hand, you know, uh, sort of mild symbionts can turn nasty too. Um, you can have um, these these little parasites that that end up becoming sort of essential to uh, their host. So um, you know, we keep uh, getting uh, hit over evolutionary time. By certain kinds of viruses that actually insert themselves into our genome, and then they gradually sort of make new copies of themselves. They get inserted into our genome. So we've got—I forget the number—like maybe about a hundred thousand copies of these viruses. Now, um, sometimes these, what you could call these genomic parasites, actually mutate, and they end up uh, taking on a function that's good for us. So they might. Um, Evolve into um, a stretch of DNA that can help switch other genes on and off. Um, so uh, we have, in a sense, kind of captured these viruses. We've kind of domesticated them. There's there's uh, uh, genes in our immune system that make our immune system work that look like they come from these parasites. There are uh, genes that are involved in forming uh, the placenta that have this kind of viral origin. So uh, yeah, so so nothing's ever permanently, you know, sort of good or bad. It's all it's all in flux. Um, you uh, 
you had an article in the Times that was really interesting recently about um, a guy named Martin Nowak, I think his name is, uh, That's right. who um, studies cooperation, uh, the evolution of cooperation, and he uses uh, game theory to model um, how cooperation might involve, might evolve. I wonder if you could just talk about his work and, and how you were led from uh, you know your normal obsession with uh, parasitic wasps and all these sort of creepy little things to um, this more sort of high level look at uh, uh, cooperation, especially human cooperation, as well as I guess he also models bacterial cooperation too. Well, the the thing is that um, you know there's this this. Uh, central question that's really interesting about uh, evolution, which is that, um, you know, natural selection is uh, fundamentally uh, about the, the uh, success of, of individuals in reproducing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if they've got genes that help them succeed, then um, those genes are going to become more common. So... Um, You've got this uh, situation where you know these individuals—they're all you know always in contact with other members of their own species. Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got genes that uh, let you somehow <coughs> manipulate <coughs> these uh, other um, members of your species and you benefit, um, then you're going to get ahead. So um, so there's this uh, basic question of like you know why doesn't everybody cheat and deceive and exploit and you know just be nasty uh, you know because you can see uh, clearly that that's not always the case I mean there are um, plenty of examples of cooperation uh, and uh, you know we like to flatter ourselves that we are wonderful cooperators and it's it's true we humans you know we, we form these very complicated societies where we help people who aren't even related to us um, but you know, uh, uh, there's there's cooperation all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. you can find birds that uh, breed cooperatively. Uh, you can find bacteria that together, billions of them, will build these biofilms, which are really sort of kind of microbial cities where different bacteria are doing different things. Um, and then you can even think about uh, you know our bodies. And how you know they're made up of like a trillion cells, and uh, you know each of those cells has DNA, and, and you know if they were just single celled little amoeba, you know each of them might have a shot at the sort of evolutionary you know posterity. Mm -hmm. But as it is, they you know when we die, they all die, um, and the only ones that get to pass uh, their genes on into the future are those you know those cells that go on to um, help build kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so in a sense, our, our bodies are these huge cooperative efforts, and when that cooperation breaks down, we got cancer. Yeah. Uh, so, so what does that have to do with math? Well, um, the thing is that, that you can actually um, build really powerful models of this process uh, using game theory, so that you uh, say... Um, you can look at players, um, and these players may represent individual people or individual bacteria, uh, and players may have uh, strategies that they can use, and those strategies can evolve, and then you can see how uh, that evolution plays out over many, many rounds. You can do like a computer simulation, and the great thing about um, looking at game theory mathematically is that you can analyze it. Um, you know, you can you can look at it. You can like just chart a graph instead of you know just building a huge supercomputer and trying to solve these things by brute force. So Martin Nowak is really kind of at the forefront of of this. Um, he uh, he's got a book out called Evolutionary Analysis where he presents a lot of these um, these ideas. And so, um, so he can look at stuff ranging from cancer uh, to human cooperation, and a lot of the same rules keep emerging again and again. And he's trying to boil down all the complexity of cooperation down to just a few simple rules. And he thinks he got just five equations that can can handle it all. Uh, 
um, and they're they're just incredibly simple. So, you know, the question then becomes: Okay, you've got your your fancy little equations. What do you do with them? So, what he's doing is he is working with people. I believe he's at uh, he's at Harvard, and I think he's working with people at the business school, um, doing a series of experiments on people to to test his ideas about strategies that work. Um, strategies that bring the biggest benefit. Um, it doesn't just oh, have so to be an very, evolutionary benefit. So, so he's really looking for real world, even economic applications of, of, the, of his mo- for his models. Yeah, I mean, there's been this really interesting uh, interplay between economics and evolution. I mean, for ever since uh, you know, ever since Darwin discovered Malthus and, and those sorts of uh, writers. Um, because you know there there is this this um, parallel where you know in economics you've got all these players and you're figuring out how they benefit and and they might benefit from cooperation or, or other kinds of interactions um, there you know they economics is one kind of currency and evolution has another kind of currency um, you know that can that can kind of go uh, in, a, in, in the wrong direction sometimes if, if people um, you know say well evolution proves that because I am a billionaire therefore I am at the summit of the history of life you know which is what some social Darwinists try to say but um, mm-hmm. but there are but there are some actually like useful parallels and um, so evolutionary biologists will, Sometimes borrow ideas from economics, and uh, sometimes vice versa. Um, I, I just have to ask you, since it's come up in a couple of our past conversations, uh, group selection. Uh, I, I'm sure you know that um, you know that this this sort of dogma over the last thirty or forty years that's come from Dawkins and George Williams and people like that is that uh, selection happens at the gene level or, or at the individual organism level, but not at higher levels, not at the level of whole populations or groups of organisms or, or, or whole species. And um, Stephen Jay Gould questioned that dogma before he died, and uh, somewhat to my surprise, E.O. Wilson, he came to my school last spring, uh, he told me he was working on a big paper that he said would would uh, was really going to shake up the field and uh, show that group back, uh, group selection uh, can actually work. So I just wonder if um, if you've looked at that controversy at all. Yeah, yeah, it's actually something I find really interesting um, because it does um, get to some of the issues we were just talking about. Um, is it possible for uh, the selection of different groups to help produce this kind of cooperation we've been talking about. Um, uh, so, um, for, for example, um, you know, say you have uh, one group of people over here who um, are very cooperative and don't get into a lot of sort of squabbles and, and they don't, you know, they're not, you know, fighting amongst themselves. And then you have another group somewhere else where they just are a lot less cooperative and and really fractious and, and killing each other. Now, you, you sort of uh, let those uh, groups kind of suffer all sorts of different challenges. You know, maybe there's a drought, or maybe they get into a fight with each other, something like mm-hmm. that. And um, the groups with these cooperative traits tend to... to uh, hold together longer, and so the individuals have more reproductive success than those, the ones in the other groups. So that's, that's a basic idea of how group selection could work in, in one uh, realm, uh, in, you know, among people. And there, you know, there's some people who are, are saying, you know, that this could actually work. Um, the, the thing is that, um, you know, group selection uh, versus individual selection or gene selection it's complicated for two reasons. One is it's not either or. So you could have gene selection going on, you could have individual selection going on, and you could have group selection going on, and they could be going all in different directions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a big mess. <laughs> and yeah. then, um, and then on top of that, um, 
the effectiveness of, of group selection and the effectiveness of individual selection and the effectiveness of gene selection, um, they really kind of, kind of come down to some, some uh, subtle uh, details. You know, how quickly um, do, you know, do, do uh, genes spread in a population, for example? I mean that's that's a tricky question. It depends on how big uh, the populations are and all these all these little details, you know. So it's it's uh, it's a little frustrating when I see in the press, you know, people making grand sweeping statements about group selection and oh and 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 Richard Dawkins is a terrible person because he talks about gene selection and blah blah blah, you know. And really, these things have to stand and fall not on on generalizations and not on what feels good to us uh, what fits into whatever political view we have it's it comes down to the details and down to the science so so here's here's sort of the history of that science i mean basically in the in the nineteen sixties uh people like George Williams and uh William Hamilton they were looking back at basically the people who were teaching them biology in the 50s. And these people would talk about how there were all these behaviors that were sort of for the good of the species. And you keep seeing this phrase again and again, for the good of the species. I mean, you see that today. Um, and these were just um, naive, uh, un really untested uh, statements. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, they were saying, look, you know, you can probably explain these things better if you just look at individual selection. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, you know, you might have a, a, a school of fish, um, and they're all kind of moving together in this, like, sort of super organism, but maybe those individual fish are all trying to get to the middle, you know, because they want to get away from the shark, and so they, they just sort of ball up, and it's all their individual actions without any real sort of um, uh, uh, effect of, of the group on them. Now that dominated for a while, um, and I would I would say that yeah today group selection is definitely having a resurgence, and mm -hmm. and you know part of it is getting down to the details. Yeah, uh, it's it's saying okay, yeah individual selection can create things that look to us like group selection, but it's also possible that um, you know that group selection can be strong enough that it can work. And E.O. Wilson has been talking a lot about ants, you know, because that's what he's studied for, for uh, decades. And when he looks in a, in an ant colony, he sees a superorganism. And, you know, the, it may be possible for, you know, one colony to succeed where another colony fails, and, and that will um, favor certain kinds of behaviors. Uh, yeah. And you know, like like workers taking care of the eggs, and so then you have group selection. So it looks like it might work. Yeah. Now, now here's just one more wrinkle, just not to go on too long about this, but um, no, we're finally getting the real story. All the uh, amateurs <laughs> have been talking about it on blogging ads. George Johnson and Bob Wright talked about it last week, but they don't really know what they're talking about. So this is great. Well, yeah, I mean. What I know is is what I, I I get from you know reading the papers and talking to the people who are doing this work, and um, so you know you can get um, you can you can even get something like group selection going on in bacteria, uh, and and I'm really interested in this because you know I've been writing this book about E. coli, and um, this the one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is that you know you can um, you can learn a lot more than you realized about. Uh, all of biology, including our own biology, by looking at something like E. coli. So, um, so E. coli, individual E. coli will uh, basically sort of commit suicide and, and blow themselves up to uh, protect other E. coli. Really? Um, and you know they will, and they will cooperate uh, not just with uh, with their relatives, but with even uh, other species to build these these biofilms that I was talking about before. Um, and um, you know, a lot of it uh, comes down to sort of how E. coli and other bacteria uh, work. They're sort of fine details. So, you know, group selection uh, is particularly effective if, um, you know, all of the um, all the bacteria in one area are just all related to each other because you started with one bacteria and then you ended up with a billion who are all related to each other. Um, so, so in some cases it seems that group selection and um, 
and this sort of kin selection is kind of starting to blur together. It's yeah. kind of hard to tell where one stops and the other starts. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you think about it, like, you know, when people talk about group selection in an ant colony, well, those ants are, are pretty related to each other, probably right. more related than they are than in some other colony. And when you think about people, if you think about people like, say, half a million years ago, you know, they were all living in pretty small groups, you know, maybe a hundred at most, and um, they tended to be related to the people they were with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's probably some, some exchange between groups, but not a lot. So, you know, are they helping their relatives? Or are they helping total strangers? It's, it, it, you, it, there's sort of this convergence going on, I think, and you're getting, getting into the, sort of the fuzzy middle. So, so group selection might be just sort of the, the hardcore, uh, so what Richard Dawkins might say that, well, what you're calling group selection is just sort of the far border of kin selection. Uh, you know, I won't speak for Richard Dawkins, but, you know, what's interesting, what people forget is that, um, you know, this all got kicked off uh, by uh, George Williams writing uh, this book about adaptation and natural selection in the 60s. And he was always, you know, perfectly willing to say that group selection might happen, um, that it might exist. And, and you know, the, the further on in his career he became more and more convinced that group selection might indeed be real. His point was that uh, people had to stop just assuming that every adaptation they saw that seemed to be cooperative had to be group selection. Right. And that's been a huge, huge uh, weight off of the backs of evolutionary biologists. Right. Because they, they've learned so much from just um, looking at biology from that perspective. You know, it's, I mean, things that, that look like they're cooperative may not be all that cooperative. They may not be all that nice. There may be um, a lot of uh, selfishness going on there. You know, it, uh, you, um, you sometimes see uh, birds, for example, um, these birds called the Seychelles warblers, where um, they, they live on the, side of the Seychelles Islands. And they, they, uh, they raise their, their kids in these big uh, sort of family efforts. It turns out that uh, a lot of the time what's happened is that uh, one dominant bird's basically gotten sort of knocked over off the top of the hierarchy by her relatives, and she's sort of making the best of a bad situation by um, stopping breeding herself mm -hmm. and just trying to help her relatives who have kicked her out of the top spot. So, you know, so if you see a bunch of birds uh, raising uh, some chicks, you shouldn't just immediately assume, oh, it's beautiful, it's warm, it's fuzzy, and it's group selection. It's not. Uh huh. You know, I feel we could have a whole show on this. I really think it's it's um, an important topic, especially as it relates to altruism and morality. There are a couple of things I want to get to before our chat is done, though. So I'd like to bring up this really interesting article you wrote for Seed uh, on... Um, how we don't even really have a good definition for life yet. Uh, so, you know, in spite of some of these statements by Richard Dawkins, Ernst Meyer has also said that, that you know, we've got the basic understanding of life in place, although there are details to work out. We don't even know what life is. So I wonder if you could talk about um, that article. And one of the points that was made was that uh, to really have a good definition of life, it would help if we had some radically different type of life to compare terrestrial life too. So tell us a little bit about um, about what about that article that you wrote for Seed. Well yeah, I, I was I was getting interested um, over the past couple of years about these sort of basic kind of life questions. I mean there's no real good term for this area. I mean I, I don't know, you could call it lifeology or something, but um, it's a big issue like when NASA builds a, a probe and they're going to go look for a life on other planets. Well, what are they going to look for? Right. You know, how, do, how do you how do you know what you're going to find? I mean, you know, if if you find uh, a penguin on Mars, you can say, ah, there's life there. But you know, what if something uh, is silicon based or, or or doesn't use water uh, as a solvent in its cells? 
What are you going to do? How are you going to decide whether it's alive or not? Um, so people have been coming up for a long time with all these different definitions for life, and um, really what they're doing is, is they're, they're taking different uh, features of life and, and saying, well, that's the definition, that's the core, that's what really matters. Um, because the, the funny thing is that you know, when, when you uh, uh, try to um, uh, define life, you, you always seem to find exceptions to your definition. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I've talked to philosophers uh, uh, who figure a lot in, in that article. Um, one in particular, uh, Kyle Cleland, who's sort of NASA's kind of philosopher in residence, as it were. And she says that, you know, people are making kind of a, a fundamental error. They think that you can define life when you can't. Um, life is not something that you can define like, you know, say, a bachelor. I mean, a bachelor, you can define it as. Uh, you know, an unmarried uh, man, uh, and but really, all you're doing there is you're just kind of organizing your concepts. Mm-hmm. Uh, life is something that needs a theory, just like uh, elements, and chemistry need a theory. And you couldn't have had a theory of chemistry if you just had water. You know, you need all these other things to uh, to compare it to, and and to see what's constant about matter and what's not and then you start to realize oh there are the you know all matter is made of these elements uh, of these atoms uh, of particles in these atoms and then you're really getting somewhere mm-hmm. so so that's why Carol Cleland says that why we really have to get out and find life on other planets or alternatively <coughs> she has suggested and I wrote about this in discover that um, maybe there's alternative life here on earth Maybe yeah, tell me about that. That I, I first heard about this from Paul Davies a few years ago, at um, a couple of years ago, when I was at that this Templeton Fellowship in in Cambridge, and I think he was working on a uh, a book on on this. Describe what you, it's weird. Life is one of the phrases used to uh, refer to this. The idea that there might be radically different forms of life right here on Earth that we haven't noticed yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every kind of life we know about is um, based on DNA. Um, there are viruses, some viruses that are just based on RNA, but they have to infect DNA hosts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's all we know about. But the question is, is that all we know about? Because that's the only thing we've looked for. I mean, if you go look for life with probes for finding DNA, you're just going to find life based on DNA. That's you know the the classic um, analogy that you always hear about in lots of different science really applies to this one. It's about the drunk who's lost his keys and it's dark out and so he's and he's looking under the street lamp and someone comes up to him and says, "You lost your keys?" And he said, "Yeah." And well, were you here when you lost them? And he's like, "No." And then they say, well, "Why are you looking under the street lamp?" And he says, "Well, it's the only place I can see anything." <laughs> right. So you know, maybe we're just drunks under the street lamp, um, and so. That's a One pretty good bet, I think, no matter what happens. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's generally a safe bet. So, you know, what to do, you know, one thing you can do is, is uh, make the street lamp brighter or get a flashlight uh, and start looking around. Um, so we already uh, have some, some clues that life may have uh, been based on RNA before it was based on DNA uh, on Earth. And so maybe some of that RNA life didn't go extinct. Maybe it's lurking around here somewhere, or maybe there's some um, alternate life that uses, you know, a different kind of genetic molecule, and we just don't see it because maybe they're really small, or you know, maybe who knows? Maybe maybe you can actually see them under a microscope. You know, ma- there are uh, lots of microbes that can't be cultured, mm-hmm. and so they're really basically unstudied. And so, you know, maybe they don't have DNA inside them, or maybe they have something else. Um, And we won't know until we figure out a way to kind of tinker around with them on the inside. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the the appealing thing about that is that um, it's a lot cheaper to look for alternative life on Earth than it is to to build a probe. And given the kind of the uncertain funding of NASA, uh, and particularly further astrobiology, maybe that's the way to go. Um, and you know, it's conceptually hard, but maybe um, 
you know, in terms of what you have to build, maybe it's not so tough. And, you know, Carol Cleland has suggested that um, you could just go to um, uh, a desert and look at this weird stuff called desert varnish um, that um, it... Uh, can you still hear me? Sorry about yes. that. I thought mm -hmm. I did. Okay. Um, I apologize to everyone for fiddling with my controls while I'm talking. This is because it's my first time. Anyway, you're doing desert great. Varnish. <laughs> so, so desert varnish is this weird crust that you sometimes see in the desert, and, and it kind of coats the ground, and sometimes it's on rock, mm -hmm. and nobody is really quite sure what uh, makes it, uh, and it's it's all over the place. And so Carol Cleland says, "Hey, maybe this is." Uh, not just some uh, mineral reaction. Maybe this is something living there, some kind of uh, life that uh, we've uh, never encountered before. So maybe if we want to start looking for aliens, and let's go to the desert. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't remember that part. I guess I had I had assumed that you were looking in you know, the traditional places to look for exotic uh, bacteria are um, the Antarctic. So uh, when I went to the uh, the Antarctic about, God, 15 years ago or so, there were people who were looking for unusual uh, microorganisms at the bottom of some of these Arctic lakes, which are permanently frozen over. And um, and then there are the, um, the deep sea vents, which have always been, well, since they were discovered, whenever it was, 20, 25 years ago, have always uh, played a part in certain theories of the origin of life. Uh, but there may be all these other places to look as well. The desert, I hadn't even... That would have been the last place I would have thought to look. Right. Um, I mean, it's certainly a good idea to look in extreme places. Um, you know, and what's interesting there is that DNA-based life can live, um, you know, just about everywhere you look. I mean, they can live miles underground. Mm -hmm. um, they need an energy source, they need a little water, and they're good to go. So um, that's important because you know um, you know uh, if what ha what happened if you know a meteorite picked up uh, you know what if there was a big impact on Earth and some rocks were lofted up into space and one of those rocks landed on Mars um, and what if that meteorite was uh, carrying bacteria with it um, that could then survive on Mars or what if life started on Mars? And then one underground when conditions there got nasty, and then uh, maybe Martian life seeded Earth. Um, these yeah. are all, you know, these these were all considered pretty crazy before, but um, they're at least considered plausible now, just from all the amazing uh, kinds of life that people find. And that's just regular life, life as we know it. So you know, uh, maybe. RNA-based life can be a lot smaller because it doesn't need to be packed full of proteins and all this DNA. You just have these tiny little RNA uh, molecules inside of a little bubble. That can be really small. Uh, and so maybe it can survive in tiny little pores where uh, other kinds of life can't survive. What's your gut feeling about whether we are going to find life beyond the Earth? Um, if you... I mean, you know, they've, you've got whole books that uh, are based on on very rigorous scientific uh, arguments that reach opposite conclusions um, about the possibility of life elsewhere, or at least of us finding it. You know, so some people say life has got to be ubiquitous, it's only a matter of time, we're going to find it elsewhere, and others, uh, there's a book, um, Probability Zero, I forget the name of it, maybe you know it, by, by two biologists saying basically forget it it's it's pro it's not going to happen uh, there's all these uh, very unlikely coincidences that had to come together to produce life on earth uh, and so we shouldn't expect to find it elsewhere what, what's what's your gut feeling about about that question well uh, I'm curious is that uh, book you're talking about a rare earth by yes. um, Peter Ward rare yeah. earth. so so again, you got to be careful with uh, the details of what they're saying. What they're saying is that they wouldn't be surprised if microbes were uh, pretty common in the universe. They're oh, really? saying that, yeah, they're saying that complicated animal type life, multicellular life, is probably rare. 
because you need, they argue that you need a certain kind of geology, a certain kind of um, history of life, uh, a history of a planet to, to get uh, this sort of complex life. Mm -hmm. so, so they're all on board for there maybe being other uh, uh, planets with life on it. It'll just be microbes. Uh, I and you know, I no maybe green, I you know I, it's 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 rarer and rarer that I come across people who who don't think that there is life on other uh, planets. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are a lot of people who you know think that there's a fair chance that there'll be life on um, in our solar system. Yeah. So like, I mean, I was just talking to Craig Venter um, for a piece and. Um, just sort of as a digression, he was... Craig Venter, the, the, the human, uh, the, tried to do a private, or did a private decoding of the human genome. Right. Uh, and at the same time, he has been doing a bunch of other really cool things. Um, for one thing, he's trying to create an artificial life form. For another thing, he is trying to... Um, he's, he's scooping up millions and millions of genes from the ocean... Um, just sort of scooping up seawater and, and busting open the microbes inside and cataloging all their genes and finding this mind-boggling diversity of genes in, in the oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's got this method for finding uh, genes, and he's just his he just he wants to go to Mars or or at least you know have his um, technology sent to Mars mm -hmm. because he just thinks he'll be trawling up genes up there too. Um, and there, you know, there are just a lot of people who sort of, you know, you know, if they're not certain there's life, at least they're they're they have reason to be uh, optimistic. And if they don't find life, they're arguing that'll be really interesting because yeah. you know there are planets and moons in our own solar system that, at least at the beginning of the solar system, um, had conditions that were should have been conducive to life. So if they yeah. don't have life, that's ac that's actually an interesting question in itself. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, how about it's a big jump to <laughs> from uh, microbes to intelligent life, so life capable of uh, hey, I think inventing microbes are reality TV. Pardon me. I, I think microbes are pretty intelligent. <laughs> okay, well, actually, what you were saying about E. coli before was uh, in a way disturbing that the idea that there are these creatures in my stomach having these very complicated social lives is um, is a little disturbing uh, but well you know I mean it also your health also depends on it yeah no I, I, mean, I guess I'm glad they're there I just don't want to think about them that much um, so uh, you got you got to take in all of nature John all of nature <laughs> oh, beautiful and disgusting. So much I've got so much nature around here. I've got, yeah. uh, you know, you've got to come and visit sometime. You'll see all the nature we've got. But, um, well, how about E.T.? So, you know, you've, we have the, we still have the SETI program, don't we? It's not oh, okay. federally funded, but it's creeping along on, on private funds. Um, what do you think the prospects for finding creatures that, might, we might even be able to communicate with and share scientific theories with and this sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so the, I'm not holding my breath on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they might be out there, but it's a big universe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, you could have a whole bunch of um, sort of uh, intelligent life forms and... Uh, they just might be too far away to communicate with us in any sort of reasonable time span. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, um, there's this uh, one uh, philosopher, I guess he is, um, I think his name is uh, Stephen Dick, I can check on that, who has basically said that, um, you know, if, if life can get past the microbe stage, uh, if you can get sort of beyond just being, you know, little individual cells and then get into sort of complex life, he says, you know, it, it might be possible that that um, it would be very uh, rare for you to find life like us because once you get on that flight path, you just take off. Um, so that, um, you know, it may be that like on the history of, uh, the long history of, of life on Earth or life that began on Earth, um, our kind of way of being intelligent life is not going to last very long. I mean, you know, yeah. think about it. I mean, it's only been about a, you know, a 
that's you know several hundred thousand years that we've been doing anything resembling talking to each other. Um, I mean, that's just a tiny little uh, blip in the history of life, which is probably about four billion years here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how long is that going to last before we, you know, kick it up another notch? And I'm not talking necessarily biological evolution, but just, I don't know, you know, maybe our technology just, just, uh, just, just explodes beyond anything we can imagine. Um, you know, I guess it's sort of the transhumanism argument. And so... Ah, that was going to be that... my wrap-up question. Transhumanism. Thank <laughs> you for bringing it up. So, what, so, yeah, so what's the question? Oh, well, I just... Um, okay, so, E.T., uh, well, just finish your thought there. So, w oh. were you saying that you think that... Uh, or was this guy, this philosopher you were quoting, saying that E.T. Is, is probably very unlikely because... Um, uh, intelligent technological creatures such as us uh, probably will find a way to destroy themselves, or uh, will uh, no, no. It's it's more sort of it's it's more the other way. It's more kind of like the nice kind of I guess Star Trek kind of uh, alternative, in the sense that they would just sort of they would just shoot up into some kind of um, civilization or existence that 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 would be very little like ours, that we wouldn't even re be able to recognize it. I see. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're always, and, you know, it's an interesting argument. Um, and it certainly is true that, you know, whenever we uh, look out at the world, we, we're trying to look in the mirror, you know. I think it's because we're just so focused on, on each other. We're such social animals that, um, you know, we want to see human behavior everywhere. Uh, we want to see it in, you know, we want to see it in our cats, and we want to see it in our aliens. And, you know, maybe it's just not there, um, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, personally, I, I think that um, Peter Ward's kind of argument about um, that maybe, uh, maybe there's a lot of microbial life out there, maybe the conditions are just incredibly rare for multicellular life to be more something thinking about more seriously just because you know he's talking about you know how you need plate tectonics to mm -hmm. to um, to have multicellular life and, and lots of other things that we really know about uh, and you know we, we know that Mars does not have plate tectonics and we know that we do and things like that I guess that you know yeah. it gets me back to the details again I mean the details matter right although of course that's the counter argument would be that uh, these are reasons why you might not expect life like ours, but you know that sort of reflects a failure of imagination. There might be, even if you look at the diversity of life on Earth uh, within a, a fairly constrained set of conditions, uh, you can imagine that um, life might arise in all sorts of other circumstances on other planets or planetoids or asteroids, God knows what, around. Uh, around the universe. Uh, that doesn't mean that we'll find it, but it's, it's a possibility. But let me just ask you, as far as transhumanism goes, um, you know, the whole sort of singularity scenario that Ray Kurzweil and some others have, have brought up, and then there are sort of um, more modest versions of that uh, that Lee Silver at Princeton has talked about, where, you know, we, we still have some fairly sophisticated um, re-engineering of ourselves uh, to make ourselves much stronger and smarter and all this. How seriously do you take all those predictions as somebody who really understands biology well? Well, um, <laughs> Lee Silver knows a lot more. <laughs> well, Lee Silver, know, who is a Princeton biologist, knows a lot more about biology than I do. That's 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 for for, for sure. Um, you know, uh, and. I mean, his book, uh, Challenging Nature, is really interesting because he just uh, goes hog wild with all of these possible ways to manipulate ourselves and, and to, you know, put human, uh, you know, maybe you could put like uh, a human egg in one mouse and a human sperm in another, another mouse and, and uh, the sperm could fertilize the egg and then it could develop and, and then you take the egg out and, uh, you know, put it in a surrogate human mother and, and then um, have a human who was conceived in a mouse. I mean, the, the, the strange thing is that um, 
there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, big roadblocks to that, just in terms of the straight biology. It's, it gets to be more of a question of, is that something we want to do? But that um, wouldn't necessarily... So that's, that's a way of producing, um, sort of, you know, freeing ourselves from the traditional biology of reproduction, but that doesn't necessarily lead to an alteration in our physiology and, and uh, cognition and so forth. Or does it? I mean, is, is Silver saying that? No, well, he's not saying that. No, he was just, um, he was he, there he was just talking about all the kind of weird ways you can just manipulate reproduction. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, nobody has, has um, you know, genetically engineered humans um, uh, in, in the sort of like, you know, selecting a gene and sticking it in a, in a, in a sperm or something like that. Um, but, you know, we're getting really good at genetically engineering other things. Um, you know, starting with bacteria, and you know, I mean, we sort of forget that um, you know, bacteria, engineered bacteria, are carrying around these human genes in them, and they're churning out all sorts of stuff that that we use, like insulin. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's just we we don't even notice that anymore. That's um, just that's industry now, not even scientific mm -hmm. research. Right, and and that stuff uh, created a lot of horror, a sense of horror in the 1970s. So I, I I think that our you know our sense of horror is sort of shifts, um, and I know I, I don't mean to be sort of amoral uh, about this. I mean I, I still think that we need to be thinking very carefully about the morality of all of this stuff and the potential environmental risks and whether it's ethical to you know engineer someone's genes who didn't ask you to you know um, right. that, uh, to ask these questions, but. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be doing that next year, but you know, fifty years, sure. I guess I'm, I'm, well, you know, I, I, perhaps overreact to the hype, but uh, you know, yeah, as I you read, should, yeah. I, I, read, we, I mean, we science, we science readers, writers, yeah, we science writers and science readers all need to have our hype, you know, meters set way high because, yeah, I mean, it, these things are always hyped up like crazy. I mean, you know, you remember gene therapy? Right, exactly. Thank oh, that you. Was that, that's what I was going to bring up. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I remember, you know, starting out long ago as a science writer, and there would be these big features about gene therapy and how we were just on the verge of just, you know, injecting genes into people to cure cystic fibrosis and everything else under the sun. Yes. Uh, and, again, you know, that makes sense on paper. It does. The, the problem is that, you know, you... Um, you know, you, 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 in some cases, like, you're, you're using a virus to carry these genes, and the virus is not, you know, doing exactly what you want it to do. It's not inserting the gene in exactly the right place. It's, it's being a virus. It's infecting cells, and it's kind of a sloppy process. So, you know, is it any surprise that we're still trying to make gene therapy work? Yeah, see, this is 20 years, 20 years later. This is one of the paradoxes of your writings about biology, and, and the, uh, Good journalism about biology is that it's sort of it's it's showing this incredible progress in understanding how genes work and some uh, some of the complexities of evolution that weren't fully understood. But the, the overall picture is one of increasing complexity um, in in how our bodies work, and so I think that sort of undermine some of the hype that we hear about how these findings can be used to transform our lives, rid ourselves of disease, make ourselves uh, immortal or at least double or triple our lifespan and all these sorts of things. So I think, you know, the picture I get is that biology is tremendously exciting, but uh, don't necessarily count on all these transformative uh, applications of those findings anytime soon. Well, you know, I I think part of the problem is that um, scientists um, deal on uh, long time scales. You know, so they will, um, you know, uh, it, you know, uh, let, let's say for example, you know, um, Crick and Watson discover the, uh, the structure of DNA along with uh, Franklin and others in the, in the 50s, you know, it wasn't until the 70s that someone figured out how to genetically engineer bacteria 
like E. coli, and then you know it, and then it took a couple more decades for it to ramp up into the biotechnology industry, which now is like a sixty billion dollar industry. Yeah. So you know that's the kind of time scale that they're working on on a lot um, yeah. now. You know, and so when they say, "Hey, we want to go sequence the human genome," and, they, and people say, "Well, why?" and they say, "Well, there are going to be all these benefits." Um, you know, to one sympathetic way of looking at it is, well, you know, they they're they're dealing on these long time scales, and we all are, have this sort of uh, instant gratification uh, vision of, of how science works. Mm -hmm. You know, you you discover something, and boom, everything's great. Um, that's the sympathetic view. You know, the other view is that, yeah, they're just hyping things up to get more funding. And, you know, I think that does happen in some cases. But, you know, it's it's very funny talking to someone again, like uh, bring up Craig Venter, who, um, you know, uh, he, was, he, he was talking about how great it would be to sequence the human genome. And there was a lot of fanfare about the that rough draft of the human genome in, I guess, 2000. Um, being sequenced by Venter's group and the U.S. government uh, and the British, gov British government teams. Um, you know, but that was just a, a, a rough draft and a not very good draft of just uh, mainly um, it, it was really looking at sort of protein coding genes. Um, and the rest was just, you know, it was, was this, this kind of wilderness. And so Venter... Uh, is one of these people who is now looking at that that other ninety eight percent of the genomes, um, and he's he's saying you know he's done, he's just published a study where he looked at um, he, the human genome and the genome of sharks. You know we, we share this ancestry that goes back four hundred million years, and there are these certain chunks of the the non coding part of the DNA that ha haven't changed very much. Mm -hmm in us and in the sharks. They're, they're pretty much the same, which means they must be doing something important. Mm -hmm. Nobody has any idea what. And so Venter's saying, look, you know, this is going to be really key to understanding how the whole genome works. Now, you know, was it, was it wrong for, for him and others to say that it was important to start doing the human genome? Um, you know, should the human genome never have been sequenced? I, you know, I, I wouldn't go that far. But, um, but it is hard to sort of Get the get the, the, the tone right. Yeah, uh, and you don't want you don't want to leave people really um, embittered. No, and you have to justify it. the expenditure of money. And I you know, listen, I I <laughs> I don't believe it from even Craig Venter, but I believe it from you that that um, <laughs> biology is a wide open about that, frontier, Jim. and uh, and you know there are lots of exciting things that we can expect. From it, uh, we might have to be patient if, when it comes to uh, to great medical breakthroughs. But um, well, but you know, but that's a that's just. I mean, in your vision of things, that would just be like little sort of nice little applications, but no real no, victory. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced no real revolution, that, I should say. <clears throat> hey, if we find some of this weird life, if we find, uh, I, I hope Venter gets to have his gadget dropped on Mars and. Scoop up dirt and start looking for alternate life forms. Uh, that that would be that would be fantastic. I would love to see that because I think that would comparative biology of that kind would blow biology wide open again. It would be tremendously exciting. I hope it happens. And I, I'm absolutely sincere that when I read your stuff, it makes me more excited about the possibilities there. So um, so anyway, uh, we are now. I think this is the longest blogging heads chat I have ever had. So I want you to save some of the wonderful things you have to to talk about for um, future conversations. So I, I'm assuming you will come back. And um, I just want to thank you for for participating in this. This was I really enjoyed it. I'm sure the audience out there uh, will too. Great. Yeah. No. I mean, there's there's lots more to talk about. There always is in biology and and. Um, Hopefully, you know, if my, uh, if my computer behaves itself, um, yeah, I'd love to come on again. Okay, sounds good, Carl. So, uh, all right, let's uh, shut this off now, then I'll talk to you okay. offline.